All right, guys, let's bring it to a close. Thank you so much for joining us today. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready to find out who's got my money? Say it. Say it again, more energy. Who's got my money? All right, that's great, that's great. I'm gonna do something, I, I'm not sure that I'm woo-woo, but I'm a little woo. So I don't know if that's cool with you guys. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna set an intention for this session right now. We have a bunch of really talented founders. We have fundraisers, we have investors, we have angel investors, we have family office guys all here in this room with one intention, which is to create a higher level of understanding of fundraising fluency, which is your ability to go out and capitalize your venture. Not just capitalize it, but make sure you can get it all the way to the end, to an exit. I have one vision, and that vision is to help founders become funders. That's what a family office is. It's somebody that exited their company for $100 million or a $1 billion, whatever it is. The average family office manages a $1 billion. So in order to do that, we're working on a series of th everything that we do here in Las Vegas and with our teams and my partners you're gonna be meeting today is around that one focus. Whether you're a real estate investor or professional, whether you're doing acquisitions or whether you're in venture and you're building a startup. Our interest, our desire, our commitment is to creating founder funders that exit their companies, which requires Technology for us to build to automate fundraising requires the community stack, which is the reason we have the Venture House properties that we do all of our events at here in Vegas and soon to be other cities. And it's the reason why we're going to be getting heavy, heavy, heavy into podcasting and content, all for the one purpose of creating the, and, and really fostering venture ecosystems around founders becoming funders. So the intention I'm going to set today, since I've given you a little bit of the vision, is that we're going to raise our vibration a little bit here. The energy that you bring, I got a phone call from somebody that's extremely well connected this week. And she's like, hey, I need you and Jordan to, to bring me your family offices. And I was like, you will not be successful. And she's like, well, why? I, I know what I'm doing. I, I'm, I'm like, I get it. But the energy is one of panic. The energy is one of like, you're super hasty right now. You're in a rush. And that's not gonna work. Because anyone that's an investor is super attuned to being approached all the time. And they're gonna feel that that energy is off. They're gonna feel that you're in a rush. And they're not in a rush because investments are not bought, they're sold. What that means is you're basically selling, or as Alex and I like to say, you're enrolling. And you're always enrolling. You're always raising, but you're also always enrolling. What does that mean? You're always enrolling investors for the future. You're always enrolling clients and customers. And you're always enrolling this is probably the most important part. This is what Lauren does, angel investor here with All In Recruiting. You're always enrolling team members to build a team that's gonna help to get this venture to actually complete its vision for the solution you are committed to creating in the marketplace. All right, so that's the intention. Today, we've got a special Who's Got My Money because we've assembled a bunch of Avengers from all over the country. They're here today, various backgrounds in, in funding, investment, family office, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna get right into it. Sammy, you ready to rock and roll? This is Sammy Lay. I've been saying her name wrong for months and months. Kind of come on up here. So you know we like to switch it up here at Who's Got My Money, so we're gonna do a couple of little sessions before we dive into some deeper stuff. Sure. You're, a, you're a numbers gal. Yes, I love numbers. Okay, tell everybody very succinctly what you do. I translate English into profit and then I give you an opportunity to decide whether or not you didn't say it correctly in English. <laughs> there you go. And she did this in Silicon Valley with some very large companies. Yes. So do we want to talk due diligence? Yes. Let's do it. Okay. Um, I'm at, currently, I have a couple clients that are at the point where they want to go, to go talk to investors. And one of the things that's a little hard about that is not knowing what a data room is and not having one built out yet. Um, I'm a little spoiled in this space. I worked really, really early stage with early stage startups that were focused on guerrilla marketing to get revenue. So we were doing this bootstrap version of the world where you didn't really need investors yet. And then I graduated to a company that was, grew to do a billion dollars of annual revenue in 13 years. I was running a series D for one company while running a series B for another simultaneously. And the reason why I'm spoiled is I inherited a data room. Raise your hand if you have a data room right now. Oh, that's good, that's really good. Uh, 
Raise your hand if you have a team that manages that data room for you. Raise your hand if an investor asked you for your data room right now, you could give it to them. Those are the people who are ready to raise. Because if we couldn't give a link to our data room, basically same day, as someone who'd already raised three or four rounds successfully, that was embarrassing on our end. And what we needed to then do is say, here's our data room, it's updated. We came to you looking for a raise, so we made everything clean and, and ready for that raise in advance. We proved the valuation that we're trying to get this investment fund and round in at, and it's still not going to be good enough because we're getting these giant valuations coming in. We have act an actual billion dollars worth of revenue coming in across these five different companies, seven total brands. And what we need to do is sometimes prove out something that we haven't had to prove out before. And so we would have a one week turnaround where they would say, okay, well, I need you to go prove out the valuation of your entire tech stock. You built this all in house. I need you to explain to me how much it's worth. And we got to the point where we had to learn how to push back on our investors and say, no, no, for an ask like that, we need two weeks. And explain why it was so important, why it was so valuable, and have them say, yes, I understand that, and then give us two weeks to go do that around with a full time staff of over 20 strategists coming from uh, ex-consultant strategists that were alumni of the top five management consulting firms. We would still say, we need two weeks to go turn that one around. So data rooms are huge. <laughs> Due diligence is really big. Most of us are early stage, right? Most of us are maybe pre-revenue, early stage revenue. We're not expecting a giant data room. Can you raise your hand if you think you have everything you need in your data room right now? Ooh, less hands. Oh, that's really shocking to me. Okay, can you raise your hand? To be honest. Yes. <laughs> that's good. Then it's a faking. That's that's good. That's good. Absolutely. Can you raise your hand if you think you know what needs to be in your data room? Okay. Now keep your hand up if you think you could go turn all of that around in three days or less. If an investor says I've got a check for you, you could be like I will make all of that right here right now. Right? If there's a check involved. Let me say something contrarian real quick. I want you to listen yeah. to this young lady. But give me by percentage, guess, what percentage of capital is going to ask if you have a data room? 60. Lower. Lower, for sure. Who cheated? Who said 3%? Ha! 3% Three per Three is the right answer. And the reason is, is 3% is the total cumulative amount of money that the venture capital industry controls out of the total available capital for venture. So when I use my words and I say uh, venture capital money, that means capital that's coming through venture capitalists. But when I say capital available for venture, that number is 97% of the available capital that's out there. It is always good to be prepared. It is always good to have the data room. If you're doing a traditional raise where you go after angel and VC money, you will need a data room. It's going to be very, very helpful for you. If you're having conversations around this alternative track that we're going to be discussing around single check writers, what I call sponsored capital, it is not something that comes up as often because you're really building a relationship of trust with that check writer based on an outcome that they want that you can produce. Okay? So, so if we can talk about that trust for a moment, if you're pre-revenue, early revenue, if you've got a forecasted revenue that's totally different than what you're bringing in right now, you are early stage for your company. One of the things that you can do to build trust, and more important, show that you are a serious person who knows your stuff, you know your numbers, you know your market, and you know your game. That it, one of them can be your data room. Another can be, hey, I know my customers super well, I know all of these things. There are a number of ways that you can prove that you're the real deal as a founder. But if one of the things is, I'm talking to venture capitalists anyways, I would love to be able to turn something around at the end of this conversation. You give me an LOI, I give you a link to my data room, is having a good data room that I'm not going to go in there going, I want to build a relationship. I don't want you to sign my check. I don't want you to give me an LOI right now because I can't give you a link to my data room right now. Go in with that level of confidence because you've already done your research. You know what's in there. You know what you can already give them right now and you know what you can turn around in three days. You ask for advice, you'll get capital. If you ask for capital with the wrong person, you'll, you'll get advice. Know when to ask for which. Okay, one last key thing you want to share with them. Oh, if you need help, ask for help. Even if you're out there saying, 
like you said, if you ask for help, you might get capital, right? If you're out there going, I need help with this, put it out there, ask for it, you will probably get it. There's almost 50 people in this room right now that are super capable. Capable. They're either in the same seat as you and, and they, you two can grow together or they've already done it and they can help you get there faster. Absolutely. All right, Sammy Lay, guys. All right, so obviously you guys know F1's happening in Vegas this week, so I had to show up in the Team Ferrari outfit because in the Walker family, if it's not Ferrari, you're out of the family. So that's just, <laughs> that's just how it works. That's the, that's the deal. That's the deal. So I just brought up the concept of Avengers. You got to just meet one, you're going to meet a bunch more. I want to pose a question to you guys, and I'm going to ask you at the end of the session if you figured out what the answer is. Who is the biggest villain, if we're talking about superheroes, superheroines, and villains, who's the biggest villain keeping you from capitalizing your company? Just be thinking in your head throughout the session. Who is that person? Ourself. What's the number one person that's keeping you from doing that, all right? All right, we're gonna, uh, Jesse's gonna kill me for this, but Jesse, I want you to come up here real quick. <laughs> all right, so guys, online every single week, Eric and I from the Founders Collective team, which is part of the Venture House Venture Venues team, we do online sessions to teach people fundraising fluency. Have a seat right here, buddy. And what we do is we help you to understand all the stuff you need in order to fundraise. And when you think it's just about pitching, it's not. We do Pitch Kung Fu every single Thursday online. The Tuesday sessions are, this, are, are where the cheat codes are for fundraising. And on those Tuesday sessions, we do stuff like product market fit, 100 client conversations. We get into go to market, which we're going to jam on in a second. We get into fundraising fluency and all the stuff that is necessary for you to be prepared. Sammy talked about that in order to be able to pitch anytime, anywhere, any place to anyone. Okay. All right. This is Jesse Norton. He's going to tell you very briefly what he does. And we're going to talk about marketing for a second. Oh uh, yeah, sure. So oh, you need the mic. Uh, talk it's in, not a real mic. Just talk it's, into it. It's, it's recording. It's, it's recording. It's, it's recording. Not, it's recording. It's recording. Oh, I see. For the cameras. He's really good at marketing, but slow on other things, I guess. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I know a real mic when I see one. <laughs> He's like, it's not heavy enough. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, uh, do I really have to? I'm not sure. Yes, you, it, we won't be able to hear it. We won't, we need it. We're recording. Okay. Entrepreneurs, they're just, they're a hard, you know, bunch to wrangle, you know? Yeah, I mean, we're. <laughs> All right, we, we, we're, we're outlier. Um, yeah, so I, I started actually in cartoons. Uh, I still am in cartoons. I own uh, Fates.com, which is like one of the last premier traditional hand-drawn animation studios. Uh, I directed the first Halo anime and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, then I, about 20 years ago, I built a sister company to interface uh, with media development, and we kind of became like the go-to agency for Madison Avenue. So I've worked on, I, I think, 70-ish Super Bowl commercials on down in my lifetime. I you know, still do a ton in interface with agencies at big league marketing. Although about 2017, 18, I realized that market's shrinking. I got to pivot. There's got to be a way to incorporate digital to what we do. We're really good at like this zero to one move. Like something is nothing. Let's make it a household name. What's involved in that? Is it growth hacking? Is it pseudoscience? what's involved um, and we put together a company called Sensei which is designed to do exactly that do the hardest move in show business we like to say that zero to one move uh, we've done companies like Damon which uh, we just announced last week we're doing our IPO ticker symbol on NASDAQ DMN come uh, come enjoy that come inside or trade with Jesse no I'm just <laughs> <laughs> So, so one of the things that we guys, one of the things I talk about as, as a capitalist is more often than anything is marketing. You guys don't have a marketing, you don't have a capital problem, you have a, you have a marketing problem, you have a customer problem because you don't know how to acquire clients. So the reason I want to chat with Jesse is he understands this very, very well. Fundraising is essentially a marketing exercise. How many of the right people can you tell your story to in what period of time? because you will have several hundred conversations and it's going to be a small handful of investors and check writers that decide to say yes. So I want you to hear some of Jesse's thoughts and opinions on this whole marketing situation. There's a reason with what we do at Founders Collective when we're teaching you that we get into go to market and product market fit before we even discuss pitching. Of course, we have pitches every single week because that's what founders want and they think, oh, this is great. But they don't realize that they don't even know their product. They don't know the offer. 
And any real investor is going to tear that apart and know very, very quickly that you haven't spoken to enough clients. So that's really where it starts. And so marketing is something I see overlooked constantly by founders that I deal with. It even happened in our port codes. When we would invest in these companies, very quickly I started saying, oh, I just gave you money and now I get to fix your marketing too. And it ended up helping me to realize, oh my gosh, my job as a, as a VC is to help you what's, fix what's broken in your capital, in your marketing and in your sales and in your team. And if you're growing really fast, Yves probably experiencing this, things will break as you grow and they have to be refixed at every single level. A great venture ecosystem actually helps and supports that by a deep bank of talent and experience and knowledge and support and community that will help a founder move through these levels as those things break. You're always breaking capital, you're always breaking your, your customers and your clients, whether you have too many of them or a process isn't working or your fulfillment's not keeping up. There's always a problem as you grow. And then last but not least, and this is one of the reasons why I love Lauren, is that your team, you could be like, I hired a COO at 30 and now we're at 162. We got ourselves a problem. We need to get some new human capital in here. But again, marketing is this thing that founders just, they're in love with their products, but they don't understand how they're going to acquire, acquire clients and customers. And Jordan and I deal with this constantly as we're being pitched for our relationships and things like that with the family offices. We can tell that they don't understand that. So yeah. what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, the, the key word that you hit, I don't know, I've talked for a while there, yeah. but there was one word that just resonates. I don't know if you guys captured it, but it, it's story. Story wins everything, the narrative. And if you can figure out what narrative resonates with your audience segmentation, that's how you win. That is the simplistic breakdown of what we do. Now, of course, we built an AI black box to further audience segment, to then inform how that creative is being served, what to transition that creative to better serve that unique audience segmentation. It gets massively complex when you, you start doing this at scale, but that's the breakdown. You've got to figure out like how the story of a business product service, whatever it may be, is going to resonate with that individual audience to get them to convert, to you know, make the move that you need them to make. You're looking for aligned capital. You're looking for partners that either have those relationships or that they themselves are the check writer, but you put the relationship first, you play the long game. They're buying you, they're buying your vision, and they're buying your ability to tell them a narrative and a story that resonates with them and is aligned with an outcome that they want, that you can produce. Super, super important. Anything else, Jesse? Yeah, I mean, what, what we find though is, is, you know, even before you have actual customers, investors wanna see that interest. They wanna see your story being resonant. Yep. And how do you create that trigger point can be like simple sign up funnels can be like just showing the vested interest of an audience ready to convert on product, service, whatever, what have you. Awesome. That's the trick. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Jesse. All right. We've got a, another local hometown hero that I've known for many years. He used to come to all of our spice gatherings for entrepreneurs. Absolutely fabulous fundraiser. Just excellent. Mr. Philip Pareto from Millennia Ventures, and he's gonna walk you through something that's very actionable and very kind of first step. I'm still going to tell you that you need to have your stuff be prepared before you go pitch you know, friends and family. But Philip's gonna walk us through what is probably the most adjacent to what you guys are looking for when it comes to fundraising, and that is raising from friends and family first. Ooh. Raising from friends and family first. Philip, yes. thanks for joining us. Thank you All right. for having me. <laughs> Walk us through this. I watched this man raise a lot of money, guys. So I hope you take his word seriously on this. So before I start, how many of you are thinking about, right. uh, before I start, how many of you are thinking about raising funds from your friends and family and haven't done it yet? Okay. They're, they're, they're right? shy. They're scared. <laughs> they're <in bed. laughs> I already did. So. Excellent. Ask. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have an eight step process for this. Okay, and I'm just gonna go through it real quick. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so first step, pre-qualify. Just figure out if the person that you're going to actually has the money. So one of my first, uh, one of the first uh, companies that I wanted to raise money for, I wanted to go to my aunt who's in London, and I asked my mother first if she had the money, but then she said she's moving to a nicer house in London, so she didn't have the money at the time. So I'm like, okay, scratch that. <laughs> So pre-qualify. Second is help the person that uh, the person that you're looking to ask for funds from. Help them first. Okay, fine. So um, the the investor for my comedy club, 
I, he was the owner of a nonprofit, right? And so I used to help him with his nonprofit first. And then after like several years of helping him with his nonprofit, then I asked him uh, if he could help me raise for my, um, for my comedy club. I talk about this in my post this week, guys. This is super, super, super important. Build the relationship first. I, I don't, I feel like founders are a really savvy bunch, but for some reason they lose all, all sense of like relationship building skills and how to win friends and influence people when they're just like, hey, Kurt, I just met you. Can you give me all your angel investors? Can you introduce me to everybody you know? I'm like, I don't know you. You could, you could be the Unabomber for all I know. I have no <laughs> idea what it is that you're trying to build or if you even have an ability to actually build it. Oh. Um, so the, first, the, the third um, item is diligence, just like we were talking about. Do you have your data room? Okay, so um, what are the, what's the most important, do if an investor tells you, hey, I want to invest in you, okay, what's the most important document that you have for them in your Sad. data room? It's your offering document, your PPM, your promissory note, your SPV, whatever, whatever it is to make sure, to give them the contract that they're going to, you know, invest in you, right? So what is the most important piece of information when they said they're going to fund you and they're going to send you the money? What's the most important piece of information that you can give them? Word. Yes, there you go. The one, hey, can I give you my Venmo? <laughs> I can't send that. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. So Cash next. Cash at me. <laughs> So next, next is for that, for that friend or family member, drop hints. Drop hints over a week, over a, a, a month, over a quarter, over a year. Drop hints that you're going to be doing this. You know, so for, I, I go back to my comedy club uh, example. So the investor, uh, my friend, I used to say, hey, do you like stand-up comedy? Do you watch stand-up comedy? Have you ever thought about investing in a retail location? Uh, because he had a service At business. At this address? No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and then come to find out, he was in a Vistage program, and in the Vistage program, they asked him, hey, what is the one thing you've always wanted to do? And his answer was, I've always wanted to do stand-up comedy. I'm like, booyah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so then I, I got information uh, from him. Um, next, uh, do, 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 do. all right, so next thing is make sure you ha you're giving them something when you're actually going to do the pitch to them and you're meeting them for lunch or dinner or whatever, and you're, they know that you're going to pitch them, right? Make sure you give them something. Give them, your, give them um, uh, your deck or give them the actual product that you have so that they know that you've put a little bit, <laughs> you've put some work into this. You know, you're not just going to ask them for money. One thing real quick, guys. <clears throat> If you're a little bit more advanced and you truly, 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 truly know your stuff and you've done the homework that Eric and I you know, would have given you, I actually don't send out decks. I don't do mm -hmm. it. And the reason is, is I want them to look at the deck while I'm presenting. It's a backdrop to me. I don't need the deck. I can present without it. They're gonna get the message and they're gonna get all the important points. Because if your deck does a better job selling than you can sell your company, you are in trouble. And I think decks are probably at some point gonna start being something that gets kind of removed from the process. I'm not sure what that'll look like yet. But what I do know is, is that decks are kind of this thing people just kind of throw at people. And the reality is, is that a lot of us funders don't actually read them. We're like, because it, it really comes down to the, the founder, you know, and our like, do we think this person has the eye of a tiger? Is this person committed, come hell or high water, come by rowboat, they're going to make this happen. Yeah, show them that passion. Um, so number six is follow up. As soon as you're done with the meeting, okay, make sure you send a follow up email with the summary points of everything that you talked about. Uh, follow, I mean, if they show interest that they're actually gonna fund you, call them every day, every other day, follow up every week. Just, if they're really showing interest, then don't let it go. Don't be apprehensive about contacting them. Call them every day. So something you can do here, guys, if somebody passes or they're not the right fit or whatever, but you, that you can tell they want to build a relationship with you, is give them updates. That's something that most founders don't do. Because what it, what it you know, telegraphs to a, an investor is that you are someone that is a man or a woman in motion, that you're making progress. And this is something that, again, will set you very much apart and will definitely get their attention, that you're giving them updates, that you're being persistent you're actually moving the ball closer and closer and closer. And again, investors do not invest by themselves. They like to invest with others. They never want to be the last check in. So they, we, birds of a feather, right? If you're an investor, it's very unlikely that you don't know any investors. In fact, it'll be very likely that most of your friends own businesses and most of your friends are investors as well. So just know that. 
If you burn a relationship or you get you cop an attitude or you act entitled in front of an investor, you do that in front of me, oh, you're done. I'll do anything for you until I see that you're entitled, which means that you're probably not the type of person that takes ownership, which means that if I give you my money, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to change when something doesn't go your way. I've seen this many, many, many times. So keep that in mind. Ownership is one of the biggest things I look for. You should not feel it's inappropriate to ask an investor what, what deals went south. You should also not be unwilling to share when an investor asks you, you know, have you made mistakes? Has there been failure? And if you take ownership of it, I think that endears. I think that creates a connection. I want to know where you've made mistakes and are you willing to see your own role in it? I also am really looking for, do you believe you're the author of your life or not? Do you believe that circumstances are bigger than you or not? Do you have a chip on your shoulder? Good. That fire in the belly I want to see. But do you believe that your color or your background or what street you were born on or whether you went to an Ivy League school, none of that matters. Because startup life, the market doesn't care. It doesn't care. It's impartial. It'll destroy your startup just like it'll destroy one of mine. It doesn't care. So save that and let that be fuel in your tank. If you've got something to prove, but don't make excuses. This is something I see a lot of, and it's just one of those things where, guys, it's the soft skills that separate the best founders. These are the ones you get paid for. Your grit, your emotional intelligence, your ability to keep going, your people skills, your ability to enroll. That's my favorite one. That's the one I look for, is can you enroll everyone else in your mission? If you look at the best fundraisers, man or woman, they're incredible en enrollers. Great. Um, so that, that's part of what I was going to talk about next. So uh, give them up, the next uh, item is give them updates and um, make it as easy as for them as possible to send you the funds, right? So make sure you send them another email about the, the wiring instructions, text it to them. And then every month or every quarter, give them updates about what's happening with their money, all right? right. Um, and then number eight is, uh, I call it luck and spirituality. Okay, so in the morning, at night, like, do whatever it is you do, chant, pray, envision, think about, just think about what you're going to do during that day to move the ball forward. And then at night, be grateful for it. And then think about what you're going to do the next day. That's it. My eight step process. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, <laughs> Phil. All right. Oh, wait, wait. You said, you asked me to prepare a vision statement yeah. for, vi for, um, Las for, Vegas. for Las Vegas. Yep. All right. So I guess my vision for, um, for Vegas is to be the next, uh, the next Silicon Valley where investors see this place as having the most fundable startups on the planet. The capital because, of capital. Because we have a community that cares about developing and growing uh, the startups and we provide unrelenting passion towards getting you guys to grow, win, and exit. Love That's that. my vision. Okay, <laughs> it has to be super laser because we're not doing questions right now. Okay, just, just real quick. So based on the advice that you're giving, uh -huh. now that we're in a down market, right, for tech, right, uh -huh. what little extra advice would you give founders just based on the times that we're in? Uh -huh. Well, you know, that that's where you go to pre-qualifying, right? The first step again. You just... Uh, <coughs> make sure you do that first step. Make sure you find out from one way or another if you ask them directly or from someone else if they actually have the capital. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, guys, don't kid yourself. Founders are getting funded every single day. I want you to pay close attention to what I said. VCs are brokers. Most VCs are not investing their own money. They're investing LP money, limited partner money. They're the general partner in the fund. They decide who gets funded, but the LPs are the ones that have all the money. So if you want to shortcut that process and you're wondering who's investing today, I guarantee it's the LPs. Who were the biggest LPs in the country and beyond? Very simple, there's three. Family offices, private equity, and third are the Fortune 2000. Every single Fortune 2000 has money to invest in startups. They don't talk about it, it's not on their website, but every single one of them has it. It's what I call sponsored capital and very often the terms that come with that are radically different than what your mind is used to. Because right now, you're selling equity in your company. That's what you're offering in return, which gets us into the four capital categories that we'll talk about. There's 60 distinct capital types. 
but there's four capital categories all of these fall inside of. Number one, you have public and gov funds. I just wrote a post called public fundraising. Anything that started as taxpayer money that's now an opportunity to come in as liquidity into your company, that's public and gov funding. Number two, you have debt. There's four major types of debt. There's collateral-based funding. There's contract-based funding, like a, a purchase order or a, a, you know, a receivable, right? And collateral is your real estate and your equipment. Cash flow is the third. This is, hey, show us that you have an income producing asset or business or your social security number that's attached to a W-2 and we'll give you money. Okay, that's that category. And then last but not least is credit. Credit is show us your credit and this is where I built a bunch of startup loans over the last many, many years is based on your credit. Those are the debt options. Number three out of the capital categories is equity. This is the one you're most used to, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a little confused by all these options, just think of two tracks. What's my traditional track where I'm gonna go out and get friends and family, VCs and angels to give me money, and on the side, if I'm willing to actually think outside of the box, go do research around this last category, which is the sponsored capital category, who do I think is aligned to my mission and purpose that will write me a very large check? So this last category is called revenue. At the small level, revenue starts as I need to get clients into my business. At a high level, I call it raised revenue because you're literally going out and raising investment for your company, but you're doing it through this lens of a conversation that's radically different than how you would do, talk to a professional investor. You're talking to a single check writer, you're talking to a decision maker at a corporation. Example I like to use in Las Vegas is, there's a company out of Utah where I'm from, Intermountain Healthcare, that slapped their name on the side of the Raiders practice facility. I saw that and I immediately knew that sponsored capital at work. What that means is they paid $14 million to the Raiders organization. You think they got equity in the Raiders? No. Do you think they got any, is it a loan? You think it's debt? No. Just to slap that name on the side of that building, which is an example of the creativity, it's unlimited what somebody will write you a check for. It comes down to your ability to figure out who these individuals are and what they'll write a check for. And again, think of it as an aligned interest. They don't care about the interest or the equity in your business. They care about the outcome you can produce, okay? Sometimes you can be talking to a corporation and you're talking to the wrong department. So we have an example of a, a founder that we love out of, out of uh, New York. And she's building a DEI uh, AI situation. It's really awesome, it's called Diverse. So what Jennifer, she's got this conversation going on with L'Oreal where they're gonna bring her on and she's gonna have them as a client at 30K. I said, you know you could be having a conversation with them for 10 times that amount. You could be having a conversation for 300,000, 500,000, 3 million if you talk to the right person inside that organization. And I know many of you guys are asking, who is that right person? That's the problem. There is no one person at any of these organizations. There is no one title in, in any of these organizations. Those are the four capital types. Fundraising fluency is helping you to understand what they are and when to play, a, a fundraising fluent founder knows when to play which card, okay? So super, super important to understand. One last thing we'll talk about on the real estate side since I've got a lot of my real estate partners here. Real estate developers are an excellent source to watch pitch because they're gonna teach you something that most founders don't know. And that is capital stack. If you listen to a real estate developer live in front of a, 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 like a municipality, they'll say, hey look, I'm doing a $100 million project. I have this amount of money from a bond issuance. I have this amount of money from a tax abatement situation. I have a mortgage for 20 something million dollars. I have money I'm bringing down, my own cash. I have some hard money that's maybe coming in and I need your $13 million to close this. You'll hear them do the ask at the end. By the time you're done, they're done, you'll hear them describe a bunch of different capital. Okay, you're like, okay, so what's the big deal? Did you notice that it was different capital types? None of those are the same type of capital. They're not coming, it's not just that they're not coming from the same source, they are different types of capital. Now guys, this is how it works in startups. The big boys and girls, this is how they play it. The game of capital is rigged. You just don't know it's rigged. And so what, this is the reason I'm starting a podcast called that. So you have to understand that capital stack is what is the capital types and who are the capital players that I could put into my, my venture at any given time Capital sequence is what is the sequence of capital and capital types that I need to have in my venture over time? What's the daisy chain of capital? And it's not inappropriate once you've warmed up the relationship with an investor to say, what's your plan to help me to get to the next capital source? Who do you know? Guys, you want 
Smart capital, not start capital. Great investors are going to bring you way more than their money. Their money is the least valuable thing they have to offer. It is their network, it's their experience, it's the people they know, it's the bench of talent that they can bring to the table, and it's also other investors that they can bring. Super, 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 super critical for you to understand. Now, if you don't know about capital types, you can't even know how to play a card if you don't know that these things exist. For many of you guys, this is the first time you've ever heard that corporations invest in startups. Where do you think most of the industries that, that we buy from came from? The best books on fundraising aren't about fundraising. They're history books, which is one of the reasons that I tend to excel in this subject because I'm obsessed with history and I'm obsessed with understanding where is the capital, capital forensic, capital architecture. How did we get superconductors, for example? I saw a daisy chain of, oh my gosh, this group funded this and this balance sheet and then up, oh, and then I saw a pattern. This pattern can be repeated and this is the thing that we seek to automate. So capital stack, capital sequence, super important to understand. All right, we have a new friend of mine, Devin Ryan Johnson, that's gonna come up here. She has no idea, she's giving me that bewildered face. Come on down, quickly, quickly, quickly. So she's gonna talk to us. Yes, yes, it's not every day we have somebody from Nashville, so. Let's do it. Let's rock and roll. Okay. Let's rock and roll. All wow. right. So Didn't you're going to tell us happening. extremely briefly, laser, what you do, and then I want you to share a few tidbits on investor psychology, okay. since we said narrative is everything. Yeah. Um, so I run an investment club where basically I source deals for LPs, a lot of like doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs that are looking for opportunities. And then um, outside of that, I make a lot of capital connections and do capital raising on much larger projects, usually 10 or 50 million and up. Yeah. Uh, 50 million pocket change for private equity groups, huh? Yeah. I, I lost that on the couch once too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, great example of investor psychology. I've got a, a deal that I'm negotiating right now between basically a private equity firm and an e-com roll up. And, What's needed to get these two parties together has very little to do with the cost of the money. It's really making sure that everybody feels safe. And what evidence can we provide on both sides of the equation to make sure that everybody feels safe? Um, and honestly, I think I have an unfair advantage as a woman in this field because I can pick Whoa, up- hold the phone. Did you just hear that? <laughs> Did you just hear that? Sometimes, even though there's been challenges in the past with diversity and it still is a, a pervasive problem, access, education, you know, and we get to work on those things. But did you just hear what she said? Sometimes your background, whether it's disadvantaged or otherwise, can be your advantage if you know how to play that card. I'm telling you guys right now, and I'm not complaining. I, I was very fortunate to grow up as a white guy to a great Christian family, super entrepreneurial, amazing parents, got to travel the world. They didn't fund any of my businesses, by the way, but as, as a white guy, I get disregarded all the time for certain opportunities. I'm not complaining about it. I play the cards that I have. She just said something. I just hope you really hear that. Because there's a lot of like frustration, and I get it, around, hey, this is where I came from. This is who I am, blah, da, 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 da. Use that as an advantage because nobody can outdo you being you. 100%. I could talk for an hour about well, the we'll do it online. unfair advantages uh, as a woman in this field. But being able to pick up on like some of the emotional subtleties of what's really going on in the conversation, most of you bros don't pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies are like, yep, yep. It's, it's really about what is everybody feeling in this situation and what do they need to see in terms of data and security to make sure that they feel comfortable going into the deal. Awesome. You know, she didn't say much, but what she said was really powerful. All right, Devin Ryan Johnson from Nashville. Thank you. Yes. Awesome, awesome. All right, next up we have Jake Claver all the way from Dallas. He's going to come up, tell us what he's been up to, his recent acquisition, and he's going to talk to us about the work he's doing with family offices. Jake Claver. Yeah. Appreciate you having me up here and, and taking the time and putting this event on. I think it's really helpful for everybody in the room. and. Uh, I'm excited to see you build out this vision you're talking about. Um, so, so a little Avengers bit about, Assemble. Yeah. That's the only way it's going to happen. So about me a little bit, uh, I'm the director of Digital Ascension Group. We are a multifamily office that specializes in digital assets. So crypto, NFT, smart contracts, blockchain, all that stuff. Um, the majority of the capital that we've put to work over the last year has been in fintech startups. I love so, fintech. It's my favorite. Yeah. Um, but you wanted to get into, you know, 
if you're going to go speak to a family office, what does that look like and how does that conversation happen and how do you build that relationship? Is that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, just his, take his clients, his partners are family offices. So that's what digital Ascension group does. So one of the things when Jordan and I are talking to family offices is we know, regardless of what their personal interests might be, we know that certain things don't change. All family offices tend to be interested in real estate. They tend to be interested in health and wellness. They tend to be interested in fintech and, and finance. They tend to be interested in, uh, I already said medical, but, and then also they're interested in uh, emerging technology. So that'd be blockchain and AI. And there's another one that I'm forgetting that they're always interested in. And so Jordan and I get to make sure we hang out with guys like Jake that have their, their eye on the prize and their focus specifically on one of those verticals so that Jordan and I can be very much in the know day to day with what's going on so that we can educate these family offices. One other point I'll just bring up real quick, guys, uh, and, and I, Jordan will attest to this. I think sometimes we look at these, these, these founders that exit their companies for a billion and we look at them like gods, demigods, whatever, where they know everything. They don't. They know the one thing that they were obsessed with for 10 years. That's it. They tend to not know about other things. And so it's very interesting where you have an opportunity in building that relationship to potentially, with the right energy of course, educate them a little bit. Show yourself as someone by your enrollment that they can learn something from. It's kind of something that you and I spend all of our time on, huh, Jordan? It's, it's just a really big thing. So keep that in mind as you're figuring out strategically who's got my money. It's, it's always about providing value, right? And so the gentleman that was speaking earlier, he explained that. Um, and it's going to take time. You've got to build relationships with the family office. Oftentimes they'll dip their toe in the water. You know, so maybe you are looking for a $10 million check. They might cut you a quarter million dollar check just to dip their toe in the water, start a relationship with you. And that's going to be after you've already provided something for them. So all the family offices that I have relationships with, I have a deep understanding of digital assets, right? And so they had small allocations. I might just, you know, have a conversation with them, provide value. Um, there's, you know, Max has been fantastic. He's my business partner right here. Um, he's, he's helped me build out the marketing. So we've had a lot of people that have, you know, reached out um, because of the niche that we're in. Funds have to market too, guys. Everything's branded these days. Everything has a brand position. You have to think of yourself as a founder, as a project. How are we positioned in the market? Make sure you've really spent some time understanding how you're different, how you communicate that difference, the stances you're willing to take, the hill you're willing to die on. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and if you aren't using social media to market whatever you're doing, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, there were some people at the event last night that were, uh, and, and some that have spoke today that are fantastic with that. You know, reach out. I think you could provide some resources if, yeah. um, and you was, you're doing that yourself, right? Yeah. So, yeah, with, with family office, um, and it's about being in the right rooms too, right? So you're here, you've, you've made the choice to be here today, uh, you're around the right people, but it's just that enrollment, what you're talking about. If you come with value, if you're gonna bring value, uh, and that's gonna be different for everybody. Um, just whatever you have that you think you can share, and eventually, like you've built up rapport with that other gentleman at the nonprofit, that's that's when you can make that ask after you've built up that that uh, relationship equity guys figure out what they care about like yeah. this goes for anybody like maybe they have a daughter that's really into a band and you happen to have access to get tickets to her show this is something I've used over and over and over because I know now they got to go create an experience it cost them nothing I put it together they're backstage and they're like you're a rock star and they say what do you want and I said nothing build the relationship before you need it way before you need it this is something, where Jordan and I are not great at everything, but this is something we spend all day doing, that delayed gratification. It's hard sometimes when you know they've got, as Yves likes to say, the bag, right? They got the bag. But make sure that, you know, if you go to them and you're really quick out of the shoot, you're just like everybody else. You're not setting yourself apart as someone that understands that all capital, every check you'll ever receive is going to come through somebody else. Super important. And guys, one of the reasons why some of these non-traditional options are really attractive is because often it's a single check writer making the decision and they're doing it as fancy as VCs and, we, and, and check writers like to think we are. We're still monkeys making an emotional decision. And that's not gonna change anytime soon, even with AI. So let's talk real quick about SPVs and why we like single purpose vehicles so much and the wave that you and I both share in believing we think there's a gigantic angel investment wave coming where all of our friends that are not currently investing 
will start saying, yeah, I'll put 25 grand in, I'll put 50 grand in, I'll put 100 grand in. Uh, yes. Once a year, twice a year. So we we've kind of pioneered this model. We have a mastermind group that we run um, with you know some of the family office members. We have sophisticated investors. We have accredited investors, high net worth individuals, um, and and we started to raise capital for these fintechs, and um, we we sourced a company and which we ended up acquiring, and so uh, building out these solutions, I, I think that that's going to be the vehicle of choice for the majority of people in the future to get in on private deals. Can you explain to them why an SPV is faster, yeah. cheaper, easier, well, we, more accessible? We, we make it a lot faster and cheaper. And easier. <laughs> um, but yeah, so traditionally it would be, uh, you might spend 10, 15, $20,000 getting that drawn up by a lawyer. Uh, you'd have to file the fund. Um, but it's a Reg D fund, so it operates outside the purview of the SEC, still has to be filed, uh, but you operate under that Reg D exemption, right? And so uh, you're able to issue securities as the, the founder of the SPV or the creator of the SPV, and it also provides limited liability for those that are coming in on the deal. So it's a separate company, separate of their estate. If there are any problems that happen with this investment, it's siloed specifically to that company, and it's, it, it <coughs> provides them protection. So this lady that spoke previously, uh, she mentioned about making everybody feel safe. I think that the SPVs, you know, 506B and 506C will probably become the standard um, for expediting investment, especially within this next wave that you're talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. We'll do some stuff online with Jake, and uh, we're working on some Jets and Capital stuff, not only here in Vegas during the Super Bowl, uh, which is one of our events that we throw for investors. It's predominantly investors at that event, um, but also we got some stuff cooking in Dallas. Yeah. So let's do it. All right. Sure, bro. Thanks. Thanks absolutely. Me. Absolutely. All right. All right. All right. Okay. You guys ready to get a little more woo? Woo! You cool with that? All right. I'm going to invite up some of my partners. I'd like to get Mr. Alex Lovely up to the stage here. He's going to tell us very, very briefly who he is. Mr. Jordan Hutchinson, can you please come join us up here? And then Mr. Eric Harris, can you please come up here? This is a studly looking little bunch, isn't it? They let me hang up here with my ugly mug. But All right, Alex, tell us who you are real quick. Yeah, hey everybody, Alex Lovely. You can find me LinkedIn, L O V E L I. And uh, yeah, I'm the founder of Legends Equity Group, Legends Mastermind. We teach people how to invest in multifamily, apartments, storage, uh, new developments, and we bring them on to live deals. Uh, yeah, so we're doing a lot of big things here in Las Vegas with Kurt and everybody here. Jordan. Uh, Jordan Hutchinson, president of Black Ocean Capital. We're a private equity fund that does home service companies and all the boring businesses that aren't as sexy as you VC guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we have a lot of fun with that and have a really good team there. And then I host events a couple times a year. And I know a lot of you have been to them and helped a lot with them and you know, really love what we do. So Awesome. And many of you guys know him. We love him, Mr. Eric Harris. Uh, my name is Eric Harris, uh, one of the founders of Venture Venues, uh, work with Venture House, we do this, uh, the events. Most of you have been to some of our events as well. Also run with Kurt, the Founders Collective, uh, do investing on the side, but more importantly, helping founders get unstuck, figure out the traction, and get you fundable, so. All right, okay, so I posed a question to you guys. I posed a question to you guys at the beginning of, of who's the biggest villain keeping you from raising? What's, what's the answer? You are. I wrote a post this week. It's featured on my profile called Fundraising. You are the problem. You're also the solution. So one of the reasons I, I am partners with these gentlemen in the various things that we're doing is because of their way of being. Their way of being. Who they, whom they've shown me that they are energetically. Jordan doesn't give up. We take on huge challenges. We put together some stuff for F1. We just had JFK and Danica Patrick do an interview on the strip. We did a buyout, uh, RFK, Hopefully sorry, RFK Jr., <laughs> right, yeah. We're really good, we're not that good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, VCs are up to crazy stuff these days. You know? um, one of the things I love about Jordan though is, is, is uh, we, we, we set the bar real high. You know, we go after it. We are always trying to think of really innovative and creative ways to, to foster founders and at the same time really love on, on the funders because the funders are the ones that can help the next generation of founders come to the mix. 
Mr. Alex, Mr. Alex and I are really big fans of transformational training, which is kind of like Navy SEAL boot camp for the heart, mind, and soul. Definitely not for the faint of heart. We run trainings every other month. Um, and one of the cool things when, you know, all of us are probably, we say we're into personal development. We say we're into really doing that deep inner work. We say that we understand that we create first in the mind, you know. Um, but Alex is somebody that, that practices that. Alex and Kasia, love. They both practice that and their vulnerability and their openness and their uh, willingness to allow people to show up as they actually are and accept them for who they actually are. And so that's something I, I really love. We also share a deep, deep vision for what Vegas can become, uh, specifically downtown, so more on that later. Uh, Mr. Eric Harris. Mr. Eric Harris is a guy that executes. Uh, a lot of people talk, this man does. He follows through, he follows up. Uh, sometimes we have disagreements as brothers, which is actually something I actually really appreciate, that we red team and we challenge things together. And sometimes people are like, what is going on? I'm like, oh, we're good. You know, we're, we're dialing things in. You know, iron sharpens iron. So for this portion of the session, guys, I would love to have started here with this, but I know that many people want to be given the mechanics of how fundraising actually works, what fundraising fluency, but at the end of the day, it comes down to in my opinion, 80% of your intention, the power and the energy that you have when you walk into the room and it announces you. So I like to chat about you know, having your mind on your money and the money mindset, your money raising mindset that you have when you go out there because in my opinion, that is the thing that separates those that are very, very, very successful in raising and those that can't. The energy I look for in friendships, in relationships, business partners, people that I'm willing to back and support. Funding is giving you capital. Backing means you're getting a whole lot more than capital. We're not gonna let you fail. That's what backing really means. And so what I look for is enrollment. What I absolutely look for is enrollment. And our other friend has just joined us, Jessica Kill. Get your ass up here from Vancouver, Canada. Okay, so real quick, real quick on Jessica. Jessica's background, she won't say much. Uh, she has, she has uh, I don't know, she, she's not happy about this. Get up here, get up here. Right here, right here, up on stage. So uh, I don't know that Jessica wants me to disclose this, but she has helped finance m some very, very large major motion pictures you guys would know. Uh, some of the biggest actors with some of the largest brands. She was the one that got them their first acting gigs. One of the largest rock and roll music artists it, it, like currently that's touring. She helped that person get where they're going and she's done a whole lot more crypto blockchain investor, et cetera, et cetera. I'm doing her intro because she needs a hype man because she just won't say any of this stuff. Uh, but anyway, uh, what, would I, what I would like to share today, guys. I just want to say, actually, I'm going to do it back on you, Kurt, because <laughs> I travel all over the place. And in the year that I've known you now, every time I land somewhere, people know you too. And they speak so highly of Thank you, you and your ability to connect and make a room and create conversation. So um, even though my back is like totally killing me right now and... I should be in a bathtub. I came here because I want to support you because you're amazing Thank you. and the people that come to Thank support you. you are awesome. So I, I'd really give it up to Kirk. I, Kirk, he's, yeah, I, I wish I had known him 20 years ago. The magic I would have done, even more that I would have done knowing you would have been amazing. Thank you. So, um, this, is a good one. this is a, this is a, for everybody that doesn't know, this is a very, this does not feel like a mic. It's 3D printed, so that's why people are like, wait, what, et cetera. Um, what you just saw there is a relationship. It's the value of personal brand being brought forth. You, you don't, most of y'all may not know who she is. She's powerful in what she does. But what she spoke of was what he's been doing for a while, which is building up his personal brand and being good at the one thing that's, that's important when it comes to fundraising outside of knowing about funding is relationships. How do you build the right relationships so you can pull on them at the right time to help accelerate you? And if it's not about money. If you go out to somebody for just the money, you may get a, you may get a dollar. A dollar doesn't solve a problem. But when you come out, and he said it, getting backed, that means someone that's willing to sit down and help you understand, strategize, figure out, plan things through. That's what it means to have an investor behind you. Because you've enrolled them. Because you, yeah, because you've enrolled them. And that's, when you start to look at things from that perspective, it's not, it's, it's a relationship. 
And, and when you care about the person more than just what they can do for you, it starts to cultivate something that's a lot different than just, hey, can you just do this transaction with me? So I just wanted you all to kind of like identify that as you're fundraising, as you're thinking about doing something, as you have an idea, whether you're a, you're a pre-seed or you're a ser you know, series A, B, C, whatever, like you are a seed rather. Whatever that is, you may need some relationship to get you over there. I know someone is actually trying to exit our company now, and it's a relationship. She needs someone to acquire it, and she needs to get those introductions. It's still, it's the same thing as fundraising. It's a relationship that can get in front of the right person at the right time. So, Yeah, so one of the things that I like to say is the most important relationship is the relationship you have with yourself and with God. So I want Alex to actually speak into this uh, a little bit because this is super, super, super critical, guys. Like... I, I don't hear a lot of founders taking personal responsibility and ownership, but more importantly, like I don't hear a lot of founders come to me and say, hey, what's your feedback on my way of being that's going to affect me from being able to fundraise? You know? And so that, that, that thing is something that just doesn't come up very often. And so I think really looking inside and saying, would I fund me? Would I back and support me based on the way that I show up? I, I like to say that we had an event, uh, Venture House does events every single month, but we had an event a couple of months ago where in my estimation, the most probably likely to be successful founder in that entire room was sweeping the floors. They were mopping the floors quietly at the end of the night. Nobody knew who this individual was. Uh, they don't seek attention. They barely leave the house. They only come out if it's an event that we're doing. I believe this individual will end up being a billionaire. No question. I have zero doubt in my mind. I see it in this person's eyes, but I also see it in the dedication, the discipline, the fortitude, the certainty of frame. Their frame is so, 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 so strong. And they're very alternative in the way they're approaching stuff. Relationship. What? What do you want me to say? Talk to us about relationship <laughs> with oneself. Okay. All right. So I guess I'll, I'll just share a story of a real estate deal that we just closed. It took 11 months, probably about three or four times during this deal that we could have lost it. Right? There was nothing more that I could have do, done, but I knew that I did my best but I had my money, some of my partner's money that was really at risk to be lost. And my relationship, you brought up like spirituality with God. I think that's gonna be really, really important because you know now that the deal's closed and I look back at it, and probably a lot of us could relate to a lot of the things that we've done in our lives, but it was all kind of divinely planned out. And we were, it's taken care of at the very end and we, we stressed and we lost a lot of sleep and you know, th there was many times where I thought, man, this is it. Like we were going to lose the deal. $300,000 of mine was going to be gone. And, you know, it really deepened my relationship to my challenges, right? Like just we can look back at some of the things that we've done and the challenges we had to come across that it was, there was things that I had to learn there to become the person that I am today. And now that the deal is closed, you know, the people that I've met, in the pursuit of overcoming those challenges, these people are gonna play a huge role in what I'm gonna create moving forward. You know, and it was planned out that way. Like I needed to meet these people. I needed to meet Kurt, I needed to meet J Jordan, I need to meet some of the partners I'm gonna be bringing on. But the challenges of that specific deal, 11 months long, there was such a divine plan for it and I didn't see it at the time. So, you know, kind of, this deal has taught me a lot about my relationship to my challenges. It has deepened my faith. And uh, yeah, so I'm just, at all the relationships, such a divine orchestration. So one of the things that we do at Founder Collective is we repeatedly tell the founders, how many founders do you know? And if you don't know founders, if you don't know droves of them, if the, if the large nucleus of your, your relationships are not founders, you need to consider that you don't have the right friends. You also need to know a bunch of investors, obviously. So one of the things that we're gonna encourage you guys to do, and the reason we keep telling these founders they need to be bringing their founders with them is because founder mental health is not something that is talked about very often. How many of you guys have experienced how lonely it is to build? Or, hey, I got screws loose in my head, nobody sees what I see, or how crazy do I think I am? So I want, I want Jordan to speak into this. Uh, Jordan <laughs> loves to swing, swing, swing for the fences, Jordan. Um, and, and I know multiple times and multiple ways, even this year, right? Uh, there's, there's been a lot of challenges. So I'd love for you to just kind of speak about this, this persistence, this, 
this you know feeling of, of down days and up days. Oh, so persistent. <laughs> I, I don't need a microphone because I can speak very well, well for you guys. Recording. But yeah. oh, it's recording. Okay, well then there you go. I, I don't know if I want to be recorded either. But <laughs> Jordan is one of the most perseverant people I've met in 20 years. Like actually, in dealing with him in the last year, very tenacious. Um, some of it's good, some of it not is not easy. But, <laughs> but you know, one thing I was reflecting on last night as we had done, you know, some activations yesterday, all of us here, um, you know, really he held the torch. And I remember being like this when I was 20. Some, a mentor of mine said to me the same thing I'm about to say to, to Jordan. Because at the time, I was, like, so blind. I didn't care what it took. I was going to do whatever. I'm here. I'm going to do it. I'm a little older now, so I'm a little bit precious and a little bit princessy. But um, it, when you don't really know the good and the bad, you just keep going forward. And you're just going to do it. And that is, I think, the trick, as I'm finding as an older sort of entrepreneur investor, is that I have become too princessy. Like, I don't want to deal with the bad. A little but, too bougie. Yeah, I'm a little bougie, yeah. I can be. I mean, I don't really look at like this right now because I'm in a bit of pain. But in the end, I realized last night that having a good group of people around me and having different people with different strengths is really, really important. And I don't think I would be here this weekend if it weren't for, for Jordan, who... I don't think he understood what he was taking us all down the beaver path of, which is another story. But we all ended up getting on the train and we freaking did it. And we did the and everybody did their part. So interestingly enough to see because being an entrepreneur is not it feels like a solo journey, but it's not. There's many people that you need to like build the spikes of your wheel. And so Jordan in my wheel in this last year has been the one that's the persistent driving youthful energy. And that was a really interesting thing to reflect on last night. So I wanna just give props to Jordan for it's a compliment. I know it sounds like it's kinda comes with some hardship, but it is. But if you can maintain that like just get her done have the vision it's very interesting to see the people who pull into the vision and support the vision happening and I, I, I know I didn't want to speak and now I'm like I don't want to give up the microphone but one last thing <laughs> to speak about manifesting you know and like the divine destiny it's nice to say that but really I, I, I articulate to the spiritual chiropractor if you have a vision for what you want to do and you tell every single person you meet, this is what I'm doing, this is my one-stop shop, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, everybody either goes away because they have nothing to offer you, they don't see it, they, they don't have anything to refer you to, no peoples, or they're like, oh my God, you got to meet my friend Kurt, you got to meet my friend Jordan, you got to meet my friend Eric, you got to meet this person, you got to do this, come to this event, come to this, do that. So when you are clear lose any insecurity and just tell everybody like Jordan this this is happening we are doing this and then that's what happens so there you go that's my power team. of intention yeah. Jordan Jordan Hutchinson founder mental health <laughs> <laughs> okay it, as founders we're in a weird spot we have this idea of what the world could be that most people don't have you wake up one day and you've got this vision of something that you want to bring to life that currently is nothing. It's just in your imagination. And then you spend the next decades of your life bringing that thing to life. And people only say, oh yeah, that's definitely possible after you've finally done it. Yeah. The hardest part is bringing that thing to life. Because you're having to balance pulling something out of nothing, then also trying to keep your priorities in check. Those of us that prioritize family and God and those things, you don't want to lose those things in the process of building your dream. The ideal is getting both. We've seen tons of people, I think a lot of us here have, that they achieve their dreams vocationally or they build whatever project or company or fund or whatever it is, but then they lose some of the other things in the process. And frankly, we know they're not happy. And then on the flip side, I know a lot of people that have great family life and you know great spirituality, but vocationally they're not putting much effort in and so they wonder why they're struggling in the world and i feel like it's this constant balance of how do you balance the spiritual and the family with trying to build your dream 
Entrepreneurs know balance? No, that's not a thing. <laughs> and, th and those that are married to them hate it because all the time they're stuck dealing with this person that's stressed out, this person that's having to go through all this crap, the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, while also somehow trying to be a partner or a spouse, and it's hard. And so those of you that are entrepreneurs, keep going through it. It sucks, but as some of you have seen, you come out on top. And I think maintaining the vision of, okay, I don't want to be a, in a big mansion or have a big yacht by myself. That would suck, you know? Nobody wants to ring the NASDAQ bell by themselves, yeah. right? We want to do it with a That's team. That's why we build community here in Las Vegas and beyond, guys. Yeah. We do it for you. We also build ecosystem behind the scenes. There's a lot, and you're going to hear us speak into some things here in a, in a minute. There is a lot that is happening with this crew behind the scenes. And yes, we're going to do well from it, but it's, it's a greater sense of purpose around knowing that this city can become the capital of capitals, that this city has billion dollar deals done every single day and we get no credit for it. People underestimate this city. I think it's the greatest city in the world to live in. And so we'll talk about that in a second. So in answering to mental health, it sucks and it's going to keep sucking. But if you've got your priorities straight, everyone wants, oh, guys, it's going to be amazing. Don't you worry. This entrepreneur thing is just like you lean see in the movies. The suck. No, lean into the suck. But prioritize. Grateful for the challenges, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Nobody gets to that point of success without going through the suck. So use it and keep your priorities in check and just focus on those things. Awesome. I, I, I want to share something, too, because from the outside, when I look at Jordan, I'm like, dude, everything just is so easy. He just gets it done. <laughs> right. But I know because we I've done, you know, we've raised a lot of capital. We've done deals. So, you know, I know what he's going through from from like my experience. Right. So I think it's important that this conversation actually came about it came about at the at the the startup in, in la where we were talking about the mental health of capital raising and a lot of people actually got really engaged and really appreciated that conversation because the truth of it is like we are going through it alone but you're really not alone and and sharing and being a part of this conversation especially from a high level from you know jordan's perspective and our perspective um i think it's gonna really bring it's a piece of what what, what it's going to take to bring really bring together this community of entrepreneurs and, and and people that are in startup and going through these challenges especially raising capital and i think as we come together capital raising is going to become easier if there's a platform that could be created from from kerr from devon like we all have the resources to make it work for all of us so that's that's kind of the vision i think has been in ruminating around in in this space awesome all right, Eric, I'd love for you to start us off and speak into your vision of what we're co-creating from your perspective. Ah, vision. Uh, vision is one of those things. It starts with an idea, transforms to a belief, belief becomes a vision, and then that kind of takes you down a path. And most of us think that that path is pretty, like, it's easy, it's paved, right? Think of highway, it's paved. And then you hit your first pothole, you got to go around your first deer. And then yeah, that, that was Manhole. really bad. Manhole, that's really bad. Uh, and, and over time, we realized that, wow, I actually don't know where the end is, et cetera. One of the things that we've done, he spoke about the Founders Collective for a while, is online community. The intent of that was to help you realize that it's not easy, it's not all paved, but here's how you can do that. Um, a lot of you are fundraising or raising in some capacity, but most of you all don't have a data room. Are you fundraising? Yes. Question, right? <laughs> but the idea of the vision is, how do we help you do that? Um, most of y'all pull out your phones, go ahead and pull them out. It's okay, pull them out, it's okay, you can do that. Uh, go to founders, thefounderscollective.com. Founders is founders without an E. Did that on purpose. Because we're cool like that. Because we can do that. This is founderscollective.com and join in. If you know of other founders, and this isn't for me, this is for you. Being a solo person in a journey on yourself, you never can climb a mountain. You always go with other people. And that's what we're building. And we want you to join others, just like you, who are trying to figure their way out in being a founder or an investor or a service provider. How do you get to the right customer, the right partner, the right co-founder, the right friend, the right relationship? That's what this community is about. And this is an in-person representation of that. The fact that somebody can be from Texas, somebody else from, where did you come from? <laughs> where did you fly in from? I flew in from Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, Vancouver, like from wherever. 
and they can still bond and create things. That's the design, that's the vision of it. And we're doing it in Vegas, but we're also doing it in other places as well. So one of the things we're doing is the Founders Collective, and we want you to be a part of that so that you can join in. Uh, I know there are several people that are raising, that are doing things, and you can't quite figure out how to get to the next place. This is a community that can do that for you. So We have pitch kung fu sessions every single week online for you to practice in front of people that understand marketing, understand investing, active investors, angels, whatever. That isn't the point though. Come and practice Kung Fu. Decide, pitch Kung Fu. Decide that you're gonna be a master. Whether it's, you're not gonna just stop fundraising, you're always fundraising, not just for this venture, but for the next one or for the next round. So take the time to become fundraising fluent. All right, Jessica, are you willing to share a little on a vision that you're creating? Not particularly, but I love your idea of the pitch kung fu. I mean, it's just really, that's like university for founders for me. Yeah. Because in the end, there's so many things that go into it, but you have two minutes to pitch and get, you know, get some interest. It's that first impression. And, you know, I've attended so many pitch events over my career. You can tell in like 30 seconds who really knows their stuff inside and out. And a lot of times it just comes down to being kind of nervous. Like I've seen people who, who if I'm just talking to them one on one, they know their jam, kind of. But, you know, they get on stage and in front of a group of people and they just kind of lose it. So having that opportunity to practice in a room full of peers is such a piece of gold. And I, you tell me about it all the time, but just hearing you say it again right now in front of this group of people, I'm like, wow, that is such a special thing that you're doing to support. So, um, yeah, I feel very lucky to be here in Vegas with everybody. And I think we kicked butt last night. We so sure did. Took some names. My, my new venture, I have a venture, a couple ventures always going on, but nothing that's in the stage to talk about okay. quite yet. But One of the things we're working on, guys, is a, is a Pitch World Series where we do March Madness and we work towards from other cities to, uh, you know, the grand finale here in Vegas once or twice a year. So, you know, we take, we take pitching seriously, but we understand that that's not actually what gets you funded. The last three events we did in, in the last month, LA, Utah, in Vegas at the, the poolside pitch, Jetson Capital and Investment Week LA, we had founders that got funded. And I know that that is the point, but if you start to believe that pitching is what did that, you're making an improper correlation. That was luck. <laughs> that was happenstance. Actually, I don't believe, that I believe everything happens for a reason. I believe there are no accidents. What I mean is, is when you go to raise again, or you have to go get the other check to stack, the check to stack on top of it, you won't know what to do, right? So that's something to think about. Yes, yeah, serendipity and synchronicity will take us very far. All right, Alex, I would love for you to speak into your vision of Vegas, downtown, and the rest. Nice. Who knows who Tony Shea is? Woo! <laughs> so, so he left some big shoes for us to fill. And I think, you know, first of all, if anybody has an opinion or a vision of what you want to see in Las Vegas and in the downtown area, um, I would love to connect with you. I think, uh, you know, a piece of that vision, a piece of the shoe that we're going to fill mm -hmm. resides inside each one of you that has an opinion about it. So what we've created is we've got uh, a couple different funds that we're starting. Okay, there's going to be a real estate arm, multiple real estate arms. There's going to be debt arm, and then there's going to be a venture arm. You know, all three of these things are pretty important for what is going to be created down there. And, um, you know, not only is your vision and your opinion going to be heard or a place to be heard, you guys also can monetize by being a fund manager, right, to not only put your opinions in, but also help raise capital and be uh, and, and make money off of it as well. Right. So we want to really build a community. My vision is to create such a large fund that uh, not just in capital, but in the amount of people that are actually a part of it. So uh, what we're creating here, there's there's just, you know, so much that's going to be coming. Um, and the way that I kind of visualize it is like, well, if we were able to raise a hundred million dollars on just the venture side, like what can we possibly do here in this community? Mm -hmm. and, 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 we're, and we're backed by $500 million right now. So we have a really huge kind of start. Um, we have debt that can't be matched by anywhere in the country. So these two things are gonna jumpstart us. And then these funds are gonna come in from the back end and offer a, an investment opportunity that cannot be matched anywhere else. So, you know, this fund, these funds really are gonna be um, 
the, the catalyst of what we're going to be building here. So if you guys are excited about what Alex just said, follow up with Alex and I, and, and we'll, we'll chat as things are developing. You, you can actually go to alexlovely.com backslash fund. Okay, if you have any interest, just put in your email address. We will continue to update people on what's going to be built through that and how you can actually be involved. So Alex Lovely backslash fund. It's L-O-V-E-L-I, lovely. Awesome. All right, Jordan, share with us Black Ocean Capital, Main Cell, Las Vegas Venture yeah, Ecosystem. Your vision. Yeah. Let's well, into it. The nice thing here is everyone has a vision and everyone's kind of working on their own projects. And that's what makes this venture community in Vegas and beyond what it is. You know, Kurt's the one that connects everybody here. We've all got our own things. And the nice thing is there's synergies between lots of them. There's funders here and there's founders here. Kurt's the means of connecting those guys. I've got Black Ocean, he's got real estate, you've got your venture house, and you've got whatever you don't want to disclose. <laughs> <laughs> but we've, a we've all got our amazing <laughs> projects that we're doing. And super connectors like Kurt are the ones that say, hey, you're cool, and you've got money, you guys should chat. You've got this, you've got this. He brings them together. And I think that's the magic of this, is we're trying to, yes, turn this into the next Silicon Valley, like you were saying. And I think it's very much possible. And that's done through people with projects, which is everyone in this room, and some guy that's got the balls to connect all of them. And that's Kurt. And I think it's amazing what we're putting together, and I think it's going to have a great future. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Guys, I don't know if you know what a Venture Studio is. It is an accelerator on steroids. And this is one of the things that I want to share to complete uh, our and my vision for what we see here in Las Vegas. When we started Venture Venues, Venture House, the vision was to create a property network with software where you, that would be on the blockchain that was fractionalized uh, and would allow for co-ownership uh, and to be able to book those properties. And we see venture houses in cities across the country where we can stack our communities, Founder Collective, Main Cell, which is for family offices uh, in these different cities. Uh, but the vision I very clearly had from the get-go was that we would build an accelerator which would take outside businesses. And more importantly, we would do the hard work of building a venture studio that would build the infrastructure necessary to accelerate this entire process, doing our own internal projects, whether it's for fundraising, whether it's building a marketing apparatus, whether it's building a gigantic content studio. Uh, these are all things that are in the works, and you guys are going to have an opportunity to participate in them. So I now have an ask for you guys, if you're ready. Are you guys ready for that? Yeah. Number one, I would like you guys to bring your friends. Tell people about what you're hearing. Tell people about your excitement. You know, your, I, I wrote a post on public fundraising. Guys, there are key stakeholders that determine whether or not you get access to resources. We talk to those key stakeholders. It is not easy work to do. There's not consensus, right? The beautiful opportunity here in Las Vegas is there is very little leadership in place here. We're at a one. We're starting as an infant in building this ecosystem. Jordan and I come from Utah. We know what a kick-ass venture ecosystem looks like that's graduating founders. We have an I-15 in Salt Lake. It looks very different than the I-15 here. In, in Salt Lake, it's billionaire, billionaire, exit, 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 up and down the I-15 corridor. They clearly understand something about community and venture ecosystems. Not very far from here. We're going to create that, but we're going to do it Vegas style. Forget the Silicon Valley crap. We don't need that. We're going to do it a different way. So bring your friends, tell your friends, bring them to the things that we're doing, and let us know how we can support you. We do want to understand. Also, be willing to do the work when we give you homework. And then the second part of it is, tell us how you're willing to show up and to be involved. You know, when we're doing Venture House events, it takes a village. You know, we go out, we get these properties. These are not rentals, guys, we own them. It is a ton of work to put those on. We're happy to do it. So that's the first ask. Number two. I mentioned we're building a Venture Studio. We are going to be hosting Venture Studio and Accelerator Summits in Las Vegas. I intend to create a gravity well that will suck in the smartest capital killers and players in the country for the benefit of Las Vegas. That is something I'm deeply, deeply committed to. And third, we're gonna start hosting creatives. You know, we think of ACE, artists, creatives, and entrepreneurs. We will start hosting uh, events around content producers, creatives, photographers, videographers, those kinds of things. So if you have people like that, we want to meet them. Why? Because I believe one of the thesis that we will have moving forward is that this city was born for content. Tell me a city that's better for content than Las Vegas. 
So when people ask me, what do you believe, what do you see as the five verticals that Vegas can really be known for, they can kick ass for, content is surely one of them. So we intend to attract the smartest and the best around content creation, which is all marketing, top of funnel, you know, all of that, social tech, community tech, you know, MarTech, all of that, I want to attract that here to Las Vegas. So those are the things. If you know any of those people in, the, in those two groups, um, I'm looking for people that are great at sponsorships. I want to train them to be very, very good at fundraising. So if you know anybody that's amazing at sponsorships, I would love to meet them. All right, guys. Welcome to Who's Got My Money. We'll see you guys next month, and we'll see you online. Let's go grab some grub, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Really, really quick, really quick. Oh, we need really a group quick, picture, really too. Group picture, but how many of you all actually enjoy and get something out of these sessions monthly? Cool. Thank many, you. Because I've seen a lot of faces over and over again. Bring someone else with you, but more importantly, um, when you t uh, see Josh Lovett, please let him know not only about this session, but what he's doing with Tech Alley. Like this is an initiative, it takes a lot of effort to do this. Mm -hmm. And hearing that from people over and over again will help kind of just boost that. So if we can ask you how to do that. We intend to bring stand Tech up and Alley do a, to the other cities that Venture House will be in. We want to stand up and do a picture. Yes. So how about we do that?